Okay, welcome, everybody. It is a delight to uh, to be hearing our guest speaker for today, Eric Johnson, uh, a very experienced photographer for half a century or more. Uh, someone who has exhibited widely, who has taught photography, and who has had a very deep abiding interest in Ernest Bloch, including the photography of Ernest Bloch. So I'm very happy to turn uh, the floor over to Eric for this presentation. Share your screen when you are ready, and we are all ears, and I'm going to mute everyone, except for Eric Johnson. Uh uh, Jesse? Yes. So I want to start with just me holding something, so I won't share. Yes, it. absolutely. Okay. All right. Hold forth. Okay. And you, you have me. You can see me. Indeed. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for this incredible invitation. Uh, it's really an honor. Uh, in certain respects, it might be a little overdue in a way, because I've been doing this for 51 years, but then this box photography, it's hard to believe. Uh, the, the, before I go to a screen share with a PowerPoint about uh, Ernest Bloch's career and, and of course, his photography, which is my focus, I would like to show you, rather than just a PowerPoint, what some of the originals actually look like. What you're seeing here is a contact print about four by five inches in size of uh, a self-portrait that you'll see soon. Uh, these are contact prints. Again, this is the size so this is, all, all this tells you right away is that this person was a pretty serious photographer. He was quite into it, quite seriously. I mean, I could go on and on with showing the physical. Then in, in 1970, I was invited. Well, I did, the, I did an initial inquiry based on a, a professor that I was studying with. Now I'm 19 years old or 20 years old uh, at the University of Oregon in Eugene. Uh, and uh, I was told that it's possible that Ernest Bloch took photographs. The great composer took photographs. Nobody knew anything about them. Somebody ought to find out. I contacted Ivan or Ivan Bloch in Bend, where he was living at the time. He said his sister had everything in the Mendocino Coast at Guala. Uh, he called her. I drove down there. I mean, not right away, but soon. And, and in the next year, year and a half with ex extensive trips down there and an independent study as a senior undergraduate, I began to make prints from Bloch's negatives. And so this is what they look like, eight by 10 enlargements, just very quickly so I can just see, you can see that they're, that's what, that's what things look like. That's what I was doing in a little dark room in a guest house of Lucien and Stephen Dimitrov in Gualala, California. Some of you will recognize that individual right there, Yehudi Menuhin. Uh, just by way of showing you what the physical prints look like rather than just a PowerPoint. So eight by 10 prints made off of neg uh, thousands of negatives. So that's why I'd like to start. Now I'll go ahead and share. Uh, let's see here. Okay, can you see this? Hello? Yes, I see it very clearly. Oh, yes, okay. thank I you. To verify that you can see everything. Uh, well, this is how it all started. Uh, you can see Lucienne on the left, 1970, a picture I took of her. She actually needed a passport photo, believe it or not. And that's her, that's, the, that's who really made it all happen for me in 1970 and 1971, uh, way back when I was 21, 22 years old. A few years later, you see Suzanne Block in 1975 at an exhibition of the prints, some of which you just saw at a gallery in New York City in 1975. And some of you know Suzanne very, very well indeed. And you'll recognize her intensity just from that one picture. I didn't ever get a picture of Ivan Block, but I did find this one of him with his father in 1950 uh, in Portland. So it's those three that opened their hearts and archived to me as a 20 year old that, that really made it possible. And I wanna acknowledge that in the beginning. It's, it's uh, without them, obviously it wouldn't have happened. And that they were very excited to see somebody having some interest. But what's surprising is the person that was of interest was 21 years old. 
Okay. Composer's Vision, the photographs of Ernest Bach. This is the most widely seen picture by Ernest Bach from 1912. And I'll get into that in detail here in a couple minutes. First of all, just an overview. Um, Ernest Bach, uh, born 1880, died in 1959, as every, everybody on this call knows. But most of you don't realize that uh, you are seeing a, phot a photographer as well as a composer. Now, it's an amateur photographer, but a very avid one. And you know, he makes photographs from 1897, 17 years old, all the way to the mid-1950s. Total of over 4,500 images, probably closer to 5,000 if you count all the images on 35 millimeter film. They range from four by five glass plates, and I showed you a couple of contact prints here a minute ago, hundreds of celluloid two by four inch negatives, hundreds of glass stereo negatives to several thousand individual 35 millimeter negatives and dozens of rolls of 35 millimeter film. In addition, eight albums of contact prints and commercial enlarge enlargements are in the archive. Yes, he did make his own prints, in fact, Lucienne, his daughter, helped him in many cases make his prints. He had a little darkroom arrangement. He developed his film and his plates, uh, and he put them in albums. Uh, but when I came along, I guess, as the second generation here, is to explore and expand literally enlarge what he did. His, his, his photographs are a diary, ranging from self-portraits, family portraits, uh, musicians, landscapes, and peasants. Okay, so that's the overview. Now, you might wonder, where is the archive at this point? Well, it's housed at the Center for, for Creative Photography at the University of Arizona in Tucson. And it was at the suggestion of Ansel Adams. It was donated by his children in 1978. Don't have time to go into the center, but let's suffice it to say, it's a, a major archive of 20th century photography, including all of Ansel's work and many, many other, other great 20th century photographers. Just by way of overview, I'm gonna break it into four parts. Uh, as most of you experts know, uh, that you have a, a block in Europe, an immigration to America in 1916, a return to Europe to compose over about an eight year span in Europe, and then returning to America, ultimately settling in Agate Beach, Oregon in 1940, all the way to his death in 1959. Just by way of, again, over, overall summary, most of Bloch's photography is diaristic. That is about his daily life and his family and his experiences. But after meeting Alfred Stieglitz in New York in 1917, his attitude towards photography changed. Stieglitz proved to him that photography could be an art, expressing feeling and the soul, which is while that's all Bloch cared about. Bloch began to explore what he could do with a more overt expression with the camera after that. And that's what you'll see. Okay, again, stepping back and looking at the big picture. Ernest Bloch's story is an immigrant story, as most of you know, the story of the hope that America represented. And here on the left is a picture he took entering the New York Harbor in 1916. And on the right, a picture near the end of his life, uh, the sunset at Agate Beach, which kind of summarizes you know, the arc of his life to a certain extent. Uh, I think I, I, I can play this. Let me just go to the next slide here. I think, let me just play it. This is an excerpt from a, some comments that Bloch actually made after the performance of his symphony, America, in 1950. I think it was in Portland. Let me see if this plays. This is what, you'll hear him speak these words. Now you see, this symphony is your soup. I hope I wrote a good work that you may come at the end and sing it with us, with the orchestra, with you, much more than music, a kind of heart, giving our heart to a great country in faith, not only in what is now, but in what has to come and can come, an example to all of humanity, of no discrimination, of unity, of different people, different race, different tongues, all that, all coming together. Wow. I, that to, to hear his voice and the energy, he's 70 years old there when he's speaking is just, I think it's just fantastic. And it's actually, uh, hopefully you could hear it reasonably well. 
Okay, let's go right to his early photography. Self-portraits. Okay, self-portraits. A big part of his photography is self-portraits. Sometimes he may have given the camera, say, take this picture of me. Uh, but many times he set the camera up, had a mechanical time delay device, which his son described to me, and because his son was in a number of self-portraits with his father, and would jump into the picture and take the picture uh, with you know a few seconds. Uh, so here he is posing as a violin student. He is a violin student of Eugene Isai, as many of you uh, musicians know. And here he is a 17-year-old uh, violin student. There's a little bust of Beethoven there in front of him if you look really closely. Uh, a couple of years later, maybe this is approximately 1900, 1902 in Frankfurt, he's beginning to study composition with Ivan Knorr, a composition teacher in, uh, in uh, Frankfurt. Uh, this is a fun picture, I think, for mu musicians, especially. This is a year, a couple of years earlier, actually, lunch in Brussels, 1898. Eugene Isai, the, the teacher and, of course, a great composer himself and a, a performer, uh, is the third from the left with the long hair. That's Eugene Isai. Block, obviously, was sitting there. He's 18 years old, so he's a youngster at this table. Uh, and on the far right is Emile Jacques Del Croves, uh, the fellow with the beard and the goatee. Uh, well, they all have goatees, but you know, on the far right, let's put it that way. And uh, another important teacher of uh, Ernest Bloch, early teacher. And in fact, I, Bloch actually took a picture in lower right here of Del Croves around, around the same time, 1897. This is Geneva. Uh, Del Croce had a method of teaching uh, music, which was very distinctive. It became known as Del Croce Eurythm Eurythmics, actually, uh, which involved a holistic method. And you, you musicians could do a lot better than I could describing it. But it was a teaching method using body movement uh, and music to connect people to the music and uh, ultimately learn at a better rate. And apparently Bloch incorporated this method in his teaching. Uh, so he was a great admirer and great, a, a great friend of Jacques Del Croze. Uh, on the, the picture on the upper left of Bloch's, another self-portrait, you'll see it again later. There's a picture on the wall, a little hard to see, far left, upper left of a, and it, it's actually, I reproduced it on the right, upper right here, it's the same image, of a painter who he loved, a Swiss painter by the name of Ferdinand Hodler. And you can see this is a song in the distance, the gesture, the connection to human body movement to um, uh, human movement, a body movement to music, pardon me. And so there's this, there, this whole connection that is going on at this period of time for, for, uh, for uh, Bloch, and it's showing up in these, in these ways. Uh, meanwhile, he's studying music, studying the piano, uh, pardon me, the violin and, the, and obviously a composition, but he's also photographing. This is a very beautiful overview picture of a cattle auction in Freiburg, Switzerland, 1898. Peasants moving the hay and near Munich, where he also studied in, in 1902, about 1902. Uh, one of the most wonderful, a few years later, now back in Geneva, hiking in the Salev outside of Geneva, the, the mountains outside of Geneva, he does this really remarkable self-portrait. He's top center. You see him with a pipe. Uh, his son is the on the bottom row. Uh, Ivan is left, uh, the, the boy uh, second from the left there, looking into the camera. And uh, I don't know who the people are, but he loved them. And so he sets up the camera. This is a beautiful, as a photographer in the craft of what it takes to do this sort of thing, he was really careful, very remarkable in his precision, you know, everything's in focus, framed, uh, uh, and here you are, these people looking into the camera. Uh, it's really kind of a remarkable uh, self-portrait with a farm family, 1909. Uh, many, many pictures of his children at, at an early age. You can see both uh, the three kids here, uh, uh, Lucien, Suzanne, and Ivan, uh, and Satigny, which is right outside of Geneva where he lived while he was uh, you know, teaching at the uh, Geneva Conservatory and composing. Uh, and you can see the pride in his face on the, on the right picture for sure, I think, in his, his three children. 
wonderful picture of them on the left. Think of that path they're on there. This is outside of his home in Satini in 1912. And here's more family pictures. So you can see the path, it's the same, same path looking a different direction uh, from two, different, two years apart, self-portrait with his wife Marguerite, his mother Sophie and his three children. And here, uh, wife, children and block again, this, that wonderful. You can just see in his face the pride as, as, a, as a father would have in, the, in his children. But think about that path because there's the same path and the same period of time, the mushroom lady from 1912. Lucienne remembered her. When I first printed this, I'll remember her. Lucienne is only, what, three or four years, well, three, I guess. So she has a pretty good memory for a three-year-old. It may have been 1913, who knows? But it's right in that zone of period of time. She remembered this woman selling mushrooms. And here's a memory for you. I didn't forget this. She said she smelled really bad. So that's, that's what Lucienne remembered about this picture. Of course, it's again, this wonderful, precise, crafted photograph. And I've done the printing, but he did all of the, the, the labor of making the photograph and uh, doing the, uh, you know, all of the, you know, the light, everything. It's just so perfect for this thing. And what a wonderful photograph it is. Okay, Alexander, I don't want to call you to explain all this, uh, but I, I do quote you here. Uh, Bloch does many self-portraits. Here he is at his desk in Geneva in, 19, uh, in 1916 with a Christ is crucifix on the wall. You can see his own pictures of close-up of the face of the crucifix uh, on the right, done about the same time, maybe a few years earlier, 1913. Uh, I will just read a few of uh, what Alexander writes here. He, Bloch explained he interpreted Jesus on the cross as a figure of a betrayed Jew, a metaphor with which he was personally to identify, not least as a result of his experience with Robert Godet which he described as the greatest tragedy in my life, and of whom he wrote, this is block writing now, it was Godet who attracted my attention to the unconscious Jewishness in my music. He would, but, this is a, uh, he was the greatest anti-Semite who translated Chamberlain's Foundation of the 19th Century, the book that made Hitler. And it was my deepest friend for 10 years, and of course, he felt tremendously betrayed by Godet. Now that's an extremely short version of that story and it'll have to suffice it to say, but you can see those two pictures he took of the face of the betrayed Jew, which he identified with, are really quite compelling. So, and more, you know, right before leaving for America, he composes the wonderful piece Shaloma, which is even now perhaps one of his most famous in widely played, frequently played pieces of Rhapsody uh, for the cello and orchestra. And he writes about it a few years later. And this is, he, you know, he takes these photographs of the cellist. So I think that's what makes it important for us when we're dealing with photography. And he writes, and I, again, I, I'll hesitate to do a lot of reading, so bear with me, but this is worth it. For years, I had been sketching a musical setting of the book of the Ecclesiastes. One day I met the cellist Alexander Bajanski and his wife. I played in my manuscript works, the Jewish poems and other things as well. All were unpublished. The Bajanskis were pr profoundly moved. At last in my terrible loneliness, I had found true warm friends. My hopes revived and I began to write a work for that marvelous cellist instead of a human voice. Why not use that infinitely grander voice, that of the violin cello? I worked for days on a cello of Rhapsody as each section was completed, I copied the solo part and Barzhansky studied it. At the same time, Madame Barzhansky worked on a statuette intended as a gift for me. She first thought of sculpting a Christ, but later decided on King Solomon. We both finished at about the same time. In a few weeks, my, ecclesiastics, my Ecclesiastes was completed. And since the legend attributes this book to King Solomon, I gave it the title Shalomo. And here he takes a picture on the lower life, a close-up picture of the statuette that Katya Bozhansky made for him. So he takes photographs. See, here he has Alexander Bozhansky at the same time. It's a wonderful portrait of him, of this cellist that was so inspiring for him. And, and next, two portraits of that Katya Bozhansky herself at the same time. You can see how carefully and, carefully and beautifully made they are. Uh, so 
you know, he's, he's an amateur, but he's really an outstanding photographer. I mean, kind of self-trained, but I think his meticulous um, nature uh, is the attention to detail, which you all are familiar with with his music, shows up in, this, in his photography and the care of which he does it. Finally, we move, he moves to America in 1916, many reasons, but uh, no, many of you know the, the biography there more better than I do, but uh, uh, obviously war in Europe is, is, uh, is on the uh, very close horizon here. Uh, he has an opportunity in, in New York to uh, conduct for an orchestra of a traveling dance troupe, uh, dancer actually, I should say, and uh, takes that opportunity. Uh, goes to goes to New York. Here he is, this wonderful picture of the New York Harbor he take, he makes. Here, getting to New York. I mean, look at this. Goes up to the high rises and takes these wonderful uh, skyline pictures of the city of New York. Down to the streets. This the the uh, the uh, automobiles, the Model Ts, I guess mostly, and of course the crowded streets uh, of, of uh, New York on the lower right. So the energy of New York. Uh, must have been very exciting for him. Uh, this is him on the right at the train station, the conductor of this Maud Allen tour. There's Maud Allen on the lower left, for those of you interested. Uh, that was, as it turns out, the, the tour collapsed in two or three months, if my memory serves. Uh, but for us, the more and more interesting things that came out of this, this Suzanne showed me at her apartment, and I took a picture of the picture, and that's what you're seeing on the upper left is Ernest Block with his camera on the far left with a cigar, upper left in the screen, you'll see him right there. And here's a close up, there he is with one of his cameras. Uh, who's to say when he picked up that camera, but this is not the, by now he's using a film camera, not a glass plate camera. But I found this on the internet. This is somewhat similar uh, on the upper right to the camera he would be using. Uh, here you see him holding it. Uh, with a little prism viewfinder. He covers it with his hand so he can see the image in the prism viewfinder that uh, sits there. So that, you know, an avid amateur photographer, there's no doubt about it. Uh, pictures he takes in New York uh, uh, shortly after arriving here, wonderful picture of his daughter Lucienne in Asbury Park, New Jersey, right across the water there from New York City. Uh, his mother Sophie at Lexington Avenue, the apartment where they moved into. I don't know what the street number is, uh, but there. But so he goes to another building across, photographs his mother with the light striking. And this is not a casual photo. This is a this is a pretty thought out photograph. If you if you think about what it took to do this picture on the left, so uh, that just gives you a sense of how how enthusiastic and careful he was about his photography. Okay, after the Maud Allen tour collapses, he has a letter, uh, has no, uh, numerous introductory letters uh, to uh, kind of luminaries in New York. And one of them is Waldo Frank, a writer and a editor of this magazine called The Seven Arts. And you can see the date, January, 1917. And, uh, but Waldo Frank was enthusiastic about Bloch's music. Fresh, fresh from Europe, this exciting music, uh, this energetic, authentic music. Uh, and he asked Bloch to write an article about, uh, about really his whole philosophy uh, for this magazine. And he titled it Man and Music and it was published in 1917. And I will just excerpt one brief paragraph because it really uh, says it'll ring, uh, ring true for many of you musicians here. The ser and serious composers persist in the obsession with technique and procedure. They discuss and argue. They laboriously create their arbitrary brain begotten works. While the emotional element, the soul of art is lost in the passion for mechanical perfection. Art is the outlet of the mystical emotional needs of the human spirit. It is created rather by instinct than by intelligence, rather by intuition than by will. Okay, that's an excerpt of that article and it I think it does a good job of summarizing his philosophy there. Now, one of the people he meets through Waldo Frank is a, a photographer and, and uh, really entrepreneur and uh, an important contributor to the history of mo modern art in America and, and uh, in many ways, and that is Alfred Stieglitz. You can see a picture of Stieglitz here on the lower right. Uh, 
put it in a summary, basically Stieglitz and Bloch had a powerful kind of emotional connection. That would be my opinion. Uh, but Stieglitz, of course, was very interested in the idea that photography could be an art and seen as an art. At this period of time, many people didn't consider photography an art form at all. It was a machine. People looked through it, took a picture. Uh, so he was, one of his great uh, goals was to uh, get photography to be more widely considered an art form. And so he writes in 1923 about something that he did a year previous. He did a series of photographs. He titled Music, a sequence of 10 cloud photographs. And then he writes, and here it is. This is probably the one quote that makes, that kind of connects Ernest Bloch to the history of photography in ways that uh, was, was significant for, for me, for sure. And he said, this is Stieglitz. He writes, so I began to work with the clouds and it was great excitement daily for weeks. Every time I developed, I was so wrought up, always believing I had nearly gotten what I was after, but had failed. The most tantalizing sequence of days and weeks, I knew exactly what I was after. I had told Miss O'Keefe, George O'Keefe, many of you know her name, I wanted a series of photographs which when seen by Ernest Bloch, the great composer, he would exclaim, music, music, man, why that is music. How did you ever do that? He would point to violins and flutes and oboes and brass full of enthusiasm and would say he'd have to write a symphony called Clouds, not like Debussy's, but much, much more. And finally, I had my series of gem photographs printed and Bloch saw them what I said I wanted to happen, happened verbatim. So Bloch, the composer, sees photography as art, not only art, but music. And Stieglitz was exactly what he was hoping would happen, happen. Here's a couple pictures from uh, uh, Stieg, uh, Stieglitz's sequence, a sequence of 10 cloud photographs. You can see the light rendition, the dark rendition, kind of you know evocative, and you can see perhaps what what block, uh, what direction Block saw when he looked at these pictures. Well, just a month later in July, uh, Stieglitz writes, this is Stieglitz's letter to Block following that meeting. And he says, and I won't read the whole thing, so I bear with me for reading more. Uh, he says, my dear Mr. Block, have you any idea of how it meant to me to have you feel about those photographs as you did, to have you see in them what you do and to know what you express I understand and feel is true. It was a memorable hour, a very rare one. And then he goes on, there was much suffering. They, had, they, had, they, they also connected very deeply on their, their suffering and their physical maladies. They were both hypochondriacs. But uh, for us, the, the connection to the, the uh, you know, this, if you will, it might be overly simplified, but Bloch gives uh, Stieglitz a kind of stamp of approval for the, the cloud photographs as music and therefore art. Uh, Bloch does not write a symphony called Clouds. Uh, here, he does, however, many of you musicians know, he writes uh, uh, almost exactly this period of time in mid-1922, uh, uh, piano works, uh, one of which was titled Poems of the Sea. Uh, and I think I have that, uh, a 60 second out, uh, excerpt here for you. Let's just see if that plays. So he didn't write a symphony called Clouds, but in, at the very same 
period within a month or two, all maybe all happening at the same time to a certain extent, he's composing that piece for the piano, which is very evocative and very expressive, uh, not unlike clouds. See, clouds, hey, the connection is pretty strong. Uh, Block by now is director of the Cleveland Conservatory starting 1920. He, he many of you musicians know he met considerable amount of his music was played in New York, Boston. He became acclaimed. Uh, it was it happened fairly quickly. Uh, and from 1917, 18, 1920, he then is uh, asked to direct the Cleveland Conservatory of Music. He moves to Cleveland, takes his family to Cleveland starting 1920. Uh, but a couple of years later, same year really, remember he's going back to New York quite frequently here. He's also teaching, had been teaching in New York, which I don't have a chance to talk about. But uh, at this same year that the cloud photographs, uh, he, uh, Alfred Stieglitz asks him to uh, write about can a photograph, write about the question, can a photograph have the significance of art? And George O'Keefe here uh, designed that cover on the left. You might, uh, there's a picture of O'Keefe. She's all, she also wrote in the, and a number of people, Marcel Duchamp, Charles Chaplin, number of interesting names, Carl Sandburg, goes on and on, a very interesting collection of people, and Ernest Bloch. Now, Bloch wrote a quite extensive piece, but I just excerpted two key phrases from what he wrote. And he mostly, this is Ernest Bloch now, mostly talks about Stieglitz and how the, you know, photography really isn't an art except Alfred Stieglitz. Well, he says that photography is an art with especially Alfred Stieglitz, is probably a better way to put it. And he goes, he says, Bloch says, every picture of Stieglitz embodies an idea and makes one think. It exceeds usual photography as far as the greatest artists, exceeds a mechanical piano. The dead camera and all their technical means are only tools in his hands. So it's like the piano is connected to the camera here in that respect, and he's making that analogy. And he goes on to say, there are pictures of hands so beautiful that one could cry before them. Almost certainly that one of these, this picture by Stieglitz is of, of George O'Keefe's hands is one that Bloch saw. Now on the right, you're seeing Bloch do his self-portrait of his own hands a few years later, 1923, summer teaching in Peterborough, New Hampshire, which he'd go from Cleveland to Peterborough in the summers to teach in uh, a uh, festival there, which I think continues to this day. Uh, but a wonderful self-portrait. Wow, look at that picture on the right. I've just, I think it's one of my favorite of, of what he's done through all these many years. But now, would he have done that if he hadn't seen Stiglitz? I can't say, but I don't think so. Okay, more self-portraits. This series is really interesting, I think, to get into uh, Bloch's, uh, I suppose, his state of mind. On the lower left is a stereo view, self-portrait as the director of the Cleveland Institute of Music, 1922, could be 23. On the lower right is a camera similar, almost certainly similar to what he used. Just so you can see, stereo was a popular thing at this period of time. You didn't have to have a stereo viewer. You could see it in 3D. Uh, but look at that intensity. Wow. Uh, I remember Lucien telling me that uh, at this period of time, he was uh, really at you know, political loggerheads with some of the uh, uh, other people at the Cleveland Institute, probably the donors and the, the financial class at the Institute about teaching philosophy and this sort of thing. So he was not particularly happy there. And here you see him at Peterborough in a kimono on the upper left, again, staring into that camera. It's like he's staring into the future, the ages, the, 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 the timelessness of it all. But here, almost the same year, traveling to Nova Scotia, um, which is quite an extensive trip in 1923. I think it's 23 if my dates are correct. Look at how happy he is. Upper right there, the other people, the native people. Uh, he, he loves them. And you can see it showing up. Uh, what a relief they were for him. And that, that, that sums up really to a certain extent how he used the camera as well, because he would use the camera to photograph uh, you know, peasants and native people that he loved so much. So, a good summary there, I think. 
uh, Clearwater Pond in Peterborough, wonderful landscapes he did, just, just gentle pastoral landscapes he made at uh, Peterborough. His daughter, Suzanne in Peterborough, a wonderful picture of her from 1923. Uh, on the other upper left, you can see the Flanzelet Quartet. Some of you are very familiar with their work in the early part of the 20th century. One of the, my understanding is one of the great quartets they were on an American tour and they uh, came to Peterborough and there's Block with the quartet members on either side of him. On the right, self-portrait, same period of time, maybe another summer, it's hard to say exactly, uh, with other members of the Peterborough uh, entourage. I don't know the name. Some of you musical experts may recognize some of these people. So uh, take a look and see what you come up with. Uh, about this time, Block gets a Model T. Uh, he named Mazinka, which he thought was kind of a funny thing because Ford was kind of an anti-Semite, but uh, so he kind of made he, he made a, made fun of that. Lucienne enjoyed telling that story. Uh, but you may ask, hold on, what's going on here? Who's taking this picture? Block parks his Model T, moves back, and takes his picture. The pride here he is the freedom. I mean, you can go anywhere. I mean, the sense of freedom he must have had. Well, it must have been extraordinary. And so why take the picture? It's about freedom. Uh, by 1924, uh, late 1924, actually in December, if my memory serves, he is, in, uh, he is really at the end of his end of the line in, in Cleveland and goes to the Southwest. You can see him over this incredible portrait of himself overlooking the Grand Canyon in 1924 in the train station on the way on that trip. Uh, above. Um, so the camera's on a tripod. Uh, there's a time delay. He goes, sits, he has a shirt and tie on and overlooking the Grand Canyon. Delightful picture. Uh, Santa Fe. Uh, George O'Keefe and Elvis Stiglitz, my, if my recollection of uh, what Lucienne said is correct, encouraged Block to go to New Mexico in 1924 to photograph, obviously, and to compose music as well. Uh, but it's also an escape from Cleveland for him. This is in, in winter, December, approximately, of 1924. You can see the wonderful picture of the La Fonda Hotel in Santa Fe, the streets of Santa Fe on the right. More streets of Santa Fe. He, I know Lucien mentioned he had a lot of fun. Uh, the, the humor he found in Louis Lewitsky's all, ki all kinds of secondhand store in, uh, in Burrow Alley there on the left, the lower left. So he must have had fun with that. And of course, many of you'll see the iconic uh, uh, street of Santa Fe here on the, on the right, upper right. Self-portrait again in Santa Fe with the snow uh, uh, in the mountains. Uh, and interestingly, and Joshua knows about this very extensively, uh, the, the visits to the Native Americans in the Taos Pueblo, and it may be, may be in Santa Fe as well, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure it was at Taos Pueblo in 1924. And he took these pictures. And really remarkable, Na this is at a Native American intertribal ceremony at Taos. You can even, if you look really closely, you can see that on the band on the hat and this this individual uh, 1920 ceremonial uh, event of some time it must have brought a lot of people together. And that may have been the place where he was taking notes on the music. Uh, and as, as most of you know, uh, this ex interest in Native American music was expressed in, of course, his American symphony and, and the most notably in the violin concerto that Joshua uh, did his dissertation on in, 19, in 1938. Two more pictures of that same individual. You can see he has a hat. He must have said, please take your hat off. He loved this face. You can imagine how he loved the, the age and wisdom he saw in this face. Remarkable. Well, San, San Francisco. He becomes a founding director, the director of the San Francisco Conservatory in 1925. He's invited, as many of you know, by Lillian Hodgehead and Ada Coment, who had a piano school if I correct, uh, in San Francisco and wanted to build it up and make it a conservatory and they invited Block uh, and he came. And you can see a picture on the lower right that was on the uh, San Francisco Conservatory website that uh, uh, of him, you know, at very much the entry point of his beginning stage of his 
uh, period as director of the San Francisco Conservatory. Picture by him, you'll notice, well, how did he do a panorama, you might wonder. Well, he had a camera which had a panorama capability, that one, <clears throat> that one uh, where you uh, saw him overlooking the Grand Canyon, the same situation. Might even have been the stereo camera where he had an option where he could take a single wide picture. I don't think so. That's that I do not know all the answers to, but he had a capability of doing a panorama view. It's a wonderful view. You can see Alcatraz in the distance, San Francisco, 1926. Of course, the Symphony America is composed during this period of time at a at a the shack in Mill Valley, uh, which was loaned to him by Lillian uh, Ada Clement, if I remember serves me correct. And here he is composing that symphony. And this love of the country. This is about the same time he becomes an official American citizen, if my memory serves. And, and this, in this, this whole symphony is dedicated to the memory of Abraham Lincoln and Walt Whitman, whose vision is held up as his inspiration. The ideals are American. America are imperishable. They embody the future credo of all mankind, a union and common purses, purpose, and under willingly accepted guidance. Imagine that, willingly accepted guidance. Wow. Uh, of widely diversified races, ultimately to become one race strong and great. A very idealistic, and I mean, that's Block. He was an idealist, there's no doubt about it. Uh, here's a wonderful portrait some of you may not have seen by Dorothea Lang, who is a Bay Area photographer of, of great reputation and one of the great photographers of the 20th century. Wonderful portrait photography. Some of you might know her work from the Depression years working from, for the Farm Security Administration. But here's a portrait she did of Bernice Block, 1929, as in the latter stages of his directorship of the San Francisco Conservatory. And I think it really captures his intensity in a way that, in a way, none of his self-portraits do. I mean, it's literally uh, very, very well done photograph, to say the least. Uh, as most of you know, he was commissioned to write the sacred service by uh, the uh, Temple Emmanuel L. in San Francisco. Uh, there was a fund, a fund made available for him from the Stern, found, Stern family, if my center of memory serves, and he accepted the commission and moved to Swiss, the Swiss-Italian border for the peace of mind needed for working on Censor Grandio's project. So this is the sacred service, a Jewish liturgical service of a, of a, ma a major work. And he said that it would be a cosmic poem, a glorification of the laws of the universe. Uh, that's what he was after. So he moved, returns to Europe, 1930, 29, right? Probably uh, late 29, early 1930. This picture is an important one. He returns to Europe and really not very long after he takes this picture, he titles it The Lonely Tree. It's one of the few pictures that he ever had enlarged. I remember seeing it on the wall of his son in Ben, an enlargement of this. Uh, so he really identified with this picture. He identified with that lonely tree, buffeted by the winds, holding strong on the hillside. Uh, and he, that, again, he identified, I suppose you could say it's like the face of the, of the, the Christ on the wall. He had this, this ice, sense of isolation and holding on to his beliefs in the midst of all this other tumult. Of course, Avada Hakadish, Sacred Service, uh, is what he works on for, I think, about three years in southern Switzerland. But let, this is the environment, the hills, the little villages, uh, stone buildings with stone roofs. This is an interesting pair, I think, because you can see how his eye was working. Uh, you look at the upper left and the you know, beautiful light. You can see he's very sensitive to light striking surfaces. But he moved over, if you look at the upper left picture, he moves to his left until one building overlaps the other, the roof line, and gets this picture on the lower right. And it's probably a little more interesting a picture because of the overlapping and the lighting. And uh, it just shows you how he was seeing. I think that's worth recognizing. It's, it's, it's a photographer's eye, if you want to put it that way. Uh, but even more important were these wonderful pictures, portraits he did of the Swiss peasants in at this period of time, 1931. And he's, he writes from a letter, uh, he says, this is an area of incomparable beauty, no cars, no tourists, no traffic, everything is perfectly harmonious. 
The scenery is most varied. Every walk leads me to another land. The houses are in old stone, picturesque and alive. I will send you some photos. So she's, he's sending some photos to Ada. Uh, the people, all of them farmers, young and old, all simple, real, ambitionless, content with their happy fate, reserved, proud, the best Swiss, perhaps the best people I have ever met. And there they are. Trees, trees, trees. He photographed trees, and trees and peasants, but uh, trees. You can see him photographing trees. You can almost see him seeing the gesture, the almost like arms and extension of the arms and, and, and a dancer moving on the left. I mean, you can, I mean, these are my words, not his, but you can almost see that he's, he's, he's really seeing that sort of thing. And you can see, this in another letter, he says, after two days of solitary walks, in spite of the snow that it again begins to fall, I was able to at last speak to the trees, the rocks, the flowers, and they replied to my heart. So he's really identifying with nature here. By the way, here you see a Stieglitz picture from 1922, dancing trees, which undoubtedly he saw blocks off. This is now 10 years earlier, of course. You can see how he's you know, moving around in order to get the right relationship between elements on the left. Here's a picture of Lucienne that her father took, and of course, a picture of Ernest Bloch that her, his daughter took in 1930 when Lucienne was visiting, wonderful picture of both. Uh, you can see how relaxed and comfortable Ernest Bloch is in the, wilder, in the uh, hills of Rovereto, and his, his, his daughter there is born in 1909. What is she? Uh, 21 or so, am I right? That'd be about right, 21 years old on the left. In fact, <clears throat> when my conversation is with Lucienne, he, she remembers distinctly the following. And he's, his exploration of trees. And while in Rovereto Block began to do a series of tree photographs, his daughter, Lucienne, remembers. It took him a good year to finally get to photographing them because when I was there in 1930, and he was walking, he would say, you have no idea how extraordinary these trees are when there are a few leaves and when it's dark in the back and they show up. He kept saying, I've got to photograph them. I must make a study of trees. And that's when he would point to them and say, now look at this harmony of trunks. So this is his daughter's recollection of walking with him in, uh, in 1930 and the, the birch trees, these high mountain trees, which you can see when he's, it doesn't, you can see clearly what he's trying to do here, exploring this, this interaction between the trunks. Uh, the, which gets us to these. Uh, well, the next step would be to start looking at trees, not only in terms of just their geometric connection, but also their expressive character in terms of music that he knew and we all know. And that, of course, are the, the following four pictures. And in 1931, the same year, Bach. Okay, he titles this Bach, uh, the, you know, the counterpoint of the two main trunks and all the intricacy in between. I mean, you can see what he was, you can see what he was thinking there. Beethoven, the bold, almost a fist punching itself out of the, out of the ground there, this tree erupting out of the ground. Wow, that's Beethoven. Uh, Mozart, a little bit harder to figure out, but, you know, I remember Lucien was saying, well, it's complete sturdy, there's a sense of light and complete. Maybe some of Mozart would be like that. Debussy is pretty clear. I mean, you know, uh, no, uh, uh, fragmentary, expressive, light, shadow, incomplete, more of a suggestion than a description. So the, the, Mozart, the, the, the uh, composers in trees. Well, <clears throat> This is interesting because you can see his enthusiasm about his photography here. This is from a letter, 1931. This is at the Hargrove Music Library in Berkeley, which I think a couple of you have visited. And he, he this is page three of a letter, uh, and he says, uh, he writes, literally, I have really got the soul of a few trees, birches, chestnuts especially, and several people were enthusiastic about them in Paris. So he's visiting Paris frequently, as many of you know, and wondered if I should 
expose, which I don't know what he meant there, maybe exhibit them. I don't not, not I do not know. All that with my lichen, this size, and he's, he draws a little square, and then enlarger. He had them commercially enlarged. He wasn't doing his own enlarge. Uh, and I had only a few printed as I made over a thousand negatives since a year. Some portraits too, very extraordinary. And you've seen some of them now. That, that is not his Leica, but it's exact, it's very, very similar to the camera he would use. It'd be purchased in the late uh, 1920s. One more for excerpt of a letter, which goes to this whole idea of connecting to the soul. Uh, and I'll just pick up from the top. And the other day alone, I discovered as I in in a in a as I discover in every walk, new extraordinary places, a real huge forest of fir trees, very rare here, where birches are and chestnuts abound. In a big canyon, I stopped, lied on the earth, began taking pictures of one, then another, amidst an influence, an impressive silence, sorry. And suddenly, it was as if the soul of each tree was warming my heart and actually communing with me. A moment of deep emotion, I cry. I had myself become a tree, a much better thing to be than a man. Later, I went by a river and then met two kids. So that shows you how deeply he was communing with nature and the camera was part of that connection. <clears throat> You'll have to tell me if this does not sound right, but uh, I'll, tr I'll give it a try. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, uh, the desire to put his music and his photographs together had been uh, a long desire. Uh, in the late 1970s, when I was in graduate school, there was a desire to, to produce something for, his, uh, in, for the 1980 centennial of his birth. And I, as a grad student, I began working with a producer from WNET in New York who came down to Albuquerque when I was in school. Short story, uh, it, we, I made a lot of extra prints because of that. Uh, it didn't happen. It was probably just too expensive. They didn't have digitization as we do today. And so uh, bottom line is in, 19, in 2012, you saw the date, I... Uh, brought it together and attempted to produce a few of these small little videos. That's one of three. Uh, and uh, I still think it holds up pretty well. I, I think it's really wonderful to see his, his photographs with the music he was composing at the same time he took the photographs. Uh, it's the only person in history where you can do that. Okay, Chatel, the high mountain, the high uh, uh, Alps in, in the French Alps, pardon me. He goes in, in the late 30s, he spends time there composing significant works, including the violin concerto that I referred to earlier. Uh, <clears throat> continues to photograph the landscape, wonderful picture of the cloud, the, 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 the roofs catching the light on the right, peasants. These then are actually not from Rovereto, they're from uh, a few years later. So I fudged a little bit on that video but wonderful faces, just incredible faces. But also people visited him. Alexander Bashansky, 20 years after the Shalomo comes to visit him. You can see the hills behind him and the, some of the, uh, some of the uh, landscape of Chatel. Uh, this wonderful portrait of Bashansky many years later. The young Yehudi Menuhin, uh, who I think is about 20 here, I, I'd have to, uh, some experts might help me there, uh, visits him as well. It's a wonderful portrait of Yehudi Menuhin on the left. And some of you have seen this one. These are all prints that I made that, you know, are, are now out there, and that's, that's good news. Uh, Yehudi Menuhin, who, of course, really had a strong connection during this block. Uh, and I'm not going to read this, but he does refer to uh, Swiss as one of the first generation of Leica fanatics, so he, he knew he was a photographer. 
uh, and uh, appreciated that. Okay, the latter stages, 1939 settles, actually 1940 settles in Attica Beach. He, he, take, he assumes a position teaching at Berkeley in Berkeley Music uh, Department and travels back and forth between Oregon and the Bay Area uh, over a number of er years in the early 50s, uh, I, th I think mostly in the 40s actually, uh, uh, to Berkeley and back uh, to uh, teach. Here you see a picture by Walt Dyke, actually a photographer in Portland who uh, was, uh, took these pictures of Ernest Bach uh, overlooking the Pacific at his uh, wonderful home over uh, at Agate Beach. You can see pictures by Block himself of looking out at the ocean, that wonderful picture on the bottom right of the ray of sun. <clears throat> this is now by Walt Dyke again on the right, upper right of Block near the latter stages of his life, 1955. He dies in 1959. Uh, that, that bench uh, on the left, this is a picture by Block on the left, so I didn't get that all labeled properly, but it is. And you can see him taking a picture of that bench he sat on. I can imagine the hours probably with notations, musical notations as well. Uh, and this quote from Walt Whitman, which he loved, give me solitude, give me nature, give me again, oh nature, your primal sanities from Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. Here a picture that Lucienne, his daughter took in the mid fifties of Ernest Flock with his Leica. You can see the little Leica on the tripod there. And there's a little cable release for you photographers, you'll recognize that. So he's not doing nearly the amount of photography at this point. Uh, and that's really associated with his travels, I would say more than anything else. <clears throat> but he is collecting agates. You can see this picture. I don't know if that was, I think it was done by Walt Dyke, it might've been Dyke Lucien, but uh, <clears throat> of him collecting agates and of course boxes of agates. Uh, hours and hours spending uh, polishing agates and and uh, revealing their beauty <clears throat> through the efforts of polishing here later in his life. Uh, I would like to conclude with this picture, which I suspect very few of you have seen, of Lucien imitating the mushroom lady. You can see the humor of Lucien here. In 1970, I took this picture. She, she was picking mushrooms, uh, and here she is, uh, imitating the mushroom lady in the sense of humor and uh, that Lucienne always had is certainly shows up in that picture. And again, I wanna be I'm so grateful to her and her uh, generosity, the family, is, but, but especially Lucienne and her generosity for, for allowing me to do this project and open up the world of Ernest Box photography for others to see. So that's it, thank you very much. Eric Johnson, thank you. Thank you so very much for that. I'm sure I'm not the only one uh, here who feels uh, fairly blown away by this presentation. Uh, so richly informative, so thought provoking, uh, just so much to process here. But I think I'm going to ask you, uh, Eric, if you could stop sharing your screen and then we can perhaps open the meeting up for uh, some discussion. Are there any, okay. any comments? Or yeah. questions for Eric Johnson. My throat is dry. I need something to drink. <laughs> Here we are, 51 years later. Joshua. Je Joshua. I was just in awe by all the uh, the trees, and I mean, it looks like I've been looking at some of the Albert Stieglitz books that I think you got them from, and I and I, I saw so, so much commonality of, of those 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 trees, and trying to find the light off the the, the branches. I mean, there's like a, the Mozart one. There's one like a I saw it was called I think the Spring Showers by by Stieglitz in 1901. It was very similar to that, and uh, I was just amazed uh, also. Um, because those those cameras must be heavy compared to the Leica, obviously. I mean, yeah. that Leica really changed everything. But yeah. uh, uh, I just, I, and also I just have a feeling that like his 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 uh, photographs and his portraits at the time, it, it just resembles a lot of his music. You know, there's so much intertwining between the music and the photographs that he is creating. So thank you for showing. Yeah, Joshua, uh, Josh, can you hear me, Joshua? Yes. Yeah. What do you mean? Tell me more about what you mean, the connection between the portraits 
and his music. I, well, I just you know when I when I'm when I listen to blocks and I'm and I'm reading some of these program notes and I'm reading a lot of stuff. I just see like you know if he has like a uh, like even all of us, those 1930 pieces, there's there's always like a relation to something that happened um, at that time point when he was in San Francisco, and then and then he's just like memorizing, it, and then he's or maybe just starting on it, and then he goes and he finishes it up in in the Alps. But it's it's just that uh, it's like he's trying to uh, resemble a portrait, like he's trying to think of all the intricacies of, of what you see in the portrait, and then he puts it in his music. That's how I feel as 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 a person who listens to his music, especially in this uh, after the Jewish cycle, and he's he's now in the United States. I just feel that Stieglitz influence in some sort, you know, like yeah, that's, he, he I, I didn't have time to go into it, but basically when Bloch comes to America, he doesn't think of photography as an art form. He thinks it as a diary. He's an enthusiast. He's taken hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pictures, but he does not think of it as an art form, like, you know, something that it can express the inner soul. But Stieglitz makes an effort, very strong effort to prove to Bloch that that's not the case, that it is. And long story short, in dinner conversations in New York, uh, with Waldo Frank, Paul Rosenfeld, a name you may know, uh, and others, uh, with Stieglitz and O'Keefe around dinners, Saturday night dinners, uh, Block comes from Europe and says, no, photography is not an art. He doesn't know who Stieglitz is. Uh, and then Stieglitz probably doesn't want to hear that. So long story short, uh, there is a process that Block goes through to kind of uh, transform, especially seeing Stieglitz's photographs, as he himself says. Uh, so uh, then he makes his own attempts, <laughs> Vlock does. Uh, I, I think the portraits of the peasants are the ones that stick with me so much. He has a, the authenticity of those people. He could just see the love. He must have had an ability to speak, get, not mean down to their level, but connect with them uh, because they, they allowed him to take photographs of them and they, he op they opened their if you will, open their faces, their souls to a certain extent to him to get those photographs. So, uh, but yes, there's quite a transition there. It's, you could do an entire hour just on that transition with Stieglitz, you can imagine. Other questions or comments for Eric? Alex, you have a, th a thoughtful look in your eye. Yes, thank you. Alex, got to hear from you. Oh, you're muted. We're, you're muted. We can't hear you. Sorry, I keep forgetting to do that. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> Eric, that was really fantastic. I so enjoyed it. Um, <clears throat> many of the pictures were familiar, but some of them really weren't. And I mean, they were real, I, I must say, fantastic uh, to see, <clears throat> you know, the uh, breadth of Bloch's interest in photography and how it expressed so much of his philosophy, really. I mean, that, that's amazing. I think the, the the connection with the peasants, as you say, was something that was extremely um, strong for Bloch because I really felt that they had a wisdom, as he expressed it, which was lost on the more sophisticated city dwellers of, you know, maybe in Switzerland or <clears throat> USA or wherever else. And I think he really relished the freshness that he felt when he was with the, the what, whom he called the simple people, but they, they simple, not, not meaning simple minded, but people who had a real very clear vision about life. And he felt that he learned a great deal from them. I, he, he's on record about, as having said words to that effect mm -hmm. here and there. Uh, <clears throat> so it's lovely to see those pictures, I must say. Um, and he really captured their characteristics so fabulously. Um, I'm going to ask you a question, though, about something slightly at a tangent. And that is, um, I, I seem to remember having seen a book containing paintings by Ernest Bloch. I would like to ask if you might be able to comment on that because sure. um, I don't know really very much how well known it is that Bloch actually was a painter of some repute, or so it seems, and I would like to ask your advice about that. Well, uh, if Lucienne is on this call, which I think she is, uh, yeah. 
she would be able to go into that. Actually, uh, I haven't uploaded it for this talk, but I do in a recent exhibition of Lucienne Bloch's work included is a abstract small scale painting by uh, Ernest Bloch done in the 20s, late 20s, uh, uh, influenced by, uh, what's her name? Help me, Lucienne. Galka uh, Shire. Yes, thank you. Well, you can go into it. I, I didn't include that because I was getting, you know, the thing would go on forever. Uh, but uh, anyway, well, you, maybe you can you speak mentioned, about that. You mentioned where some of his paintings are in Berkeley, at, at yes. UC Berkeley, yeah. which um, we have a handful of his um, paintings as well. And so I did have one in the exhibit with a with a portrait that my grandmother had sketched of Block. Yeah. And it's um, everybody that saw that, you know, I think Paul Klee was one of the names that was thrown oh. out because uh -huh. Galka Shire had four artists that she represented as a as a art um, dealer. And Paul Klee, uh, Yelensky, Alexander Yelensky, I'm going to forget the other two names right now, but if you look her up, you can see, and, and they were having an affair in the early 20s or mid 20s. And she gave him some stuff and he did some paintings. I think that's, a, I think his artistic nature at that time really excelled. It spurred a, an, an interest of painting different, differently than he had. Definitely more modern and um, abstract. Because mm -hmm. a lot of his other stuff are more redwood trees or yes. um, nature. He loved hod Hodler, so you know you would have a, the ocean with other things that were you know more reminiscent of Hodler. Well, you would probably have then. You have more than the, just the one that you exhibited. Yeah. So yeah. answer, Alex. Yes, they exist. I don't know of a book of them. Though. I I don't know of a book either. Well, Alex, you have seen everything. So the question is, <laughs> no. where is it? Because yeah, no. the answer is yes, there has been, he did some paintings in the late 20, in the 1920s. Ah, I see. No, I'm, I'm, no, please don't say I know everything. <laughs> oh, <laughs> That's a big no, joke. The book. Uh, about the, the book, though, I have seen the book. And it was at the home of Joella Whirlin when she was living still in Portland, Oregon. And when I was visiting there, uh, okay. she showed me this. And unfortunately, for some reason, and I can't understand why, mm -hmm. I didn't take um, a note of all the details of the book so that I could then get maybe a copy myself. It was a nice, um, I wouldn't say it was a coffee table book, but it was a very, very nicely produced uh, on excellent paper, uh, a really fine book of um, prints and everything like that, and including um, those by Ernest Bloch. So uh, I, I was, I, I just, didn't know really um, anything much more about that. But then in the context of all the photography that you mentioned uh, during your talk, which is so, so, so compelling really, um, I just wanted to know if there was some kind of relationship between the photography and the paintings, or, or, or of course, aspects of visual art. Um, and and yeah, so perhaps I, if you had any comment on that. Yeah, I, I wish I could pull them up, but it would probably take, two, I have, so many things deep in my computer here. Uh, there, he did some small five by seven inch watercolors that are in the Hargrove Music Library that are basically tree trunks, redwood tree trunks, vertically spaced, not unlike what he saw in those photographs of birch trees in, in Switzerland. Uh, things like that that are kind of very geometrically, uh, very simple, very geometric. Uh, and that's what I've seen until uh, Lucien exhibited that uh, piece that he did in the 20s of uh, this geometry. It's a, a kind of a Paul Clay uh, similar. I'm, I'm actually, it's on my iPhone. I'm trying to transfer, <laughs> transfer it to my iMac uh, to see if I can get it to you. But uh, meanwhile, I, I uh, let's just see here. Okay. Uh, can I screen share? Go right ahead, Eric. Sure. Uh, it just I won't. I don't want to do too much now. But uh, that is the piece that Lucien 
uh, Alan just put in the show. Well, they, the Hancock College put it in the show. It's, and that's that, Lucien, that is the piece with reflections in the glass that uh, Block did in what, 1928? Uh, and you can see, those of you know uh, Paul Clay's work, uh, the European abstractionists from the 19, the teens and the 20s will recognize that, you know, the geometry that this is about what, about 10 by 12 inches, something like that, or maybe 11 by 14 inches, something like that in size. Uh, but you can see what he's doing there. He's got some various forms and there's a, it's a, a kind of a sky and a, it's a bit surreal at the same time. Uh, it's it's very interesting. Now you have more of these, right, Lucien? Yeah, we have a handful of them. Yeah. So, but this is the one right. that's the most um, abstract by far. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, so that's by way of answering what um, what uh, uh, Alex is asking. That's what I know. Okay. Did Bloch write about his paintings at all? I, not that I know. Well, um, I think it's possible. And I have a couple letters that I took photographs of when I did some research on Galka Shire and Ernest Bloch's relationship back in 2013. I went down to the Getty Research Institute and um, the letters between the two of them I don't know how many, but there were a handful of them were there. And I know they talked about art. I just don't know if he specifically talked about his art. So I'd have to look and see from the letters I took if he, if he did. The letters I took photographs of, I should say. I didn't take the letters. <laughs> you know, um, hi. I don't know if I can say one little thing here. Um, I'm Celia Starr. I teach art history. Hi, Celia. And, uh, hi. hi, Celia. Hi. Uh, help, help, help. No, I just one little thing I'm I'm thinking about in relationship to this piece and Galka is that she, as you were saying, Lucienne, she she really focused on these four artists, you know, um, Yelinsky, Paul Clay, but also uh, Kandinsky and uh, Feiniger. And one thing that they all have in common with Block is the interest in not only music like Kandinsky, who was a musician himself, but also the spiritual in art, right? So this connection between music, spirituality and art. And so that's one thing that I definitely see. I can see how, how Galka and Ernest Bloch would have connected on that level in relationship to her promotion of these artists. I'm so happy you're here, Celia. <laughs> Well, it was a great talk. I'm glad I was able to listen. Oh, thank you. So I'll stop share if that's okay with everybody. Thank you. But I'm glad I found that. Any other questions? I, you know what, I do have another question. <laughs> or, I mean, I just made a statement. But a question I have is when you were talking, Eric, about the photo that Ernest made of his car, and, yes. you, and you said it was all about freedom. I was just curious, are you talking about the freedom of having a small camera and being able to now photograph in all these different places or the freedom of the landscape or? I, I think freedom of being in America. Mm. It just become a citizen. Mm -hmm. Uh, thereabouts. Some of you connect, can connect, correct me, the date of when he was a citizen, became a citizen, about 1924 or so. And uh, I mean, I'm speculating to a certain extent there, but there's so many pictures. I only showed one, but I could have shown seven or eight or nine of his car, of him uh, re repairing his tire, of him sitting and having a picnic lunch, of him, uh, more pictures of the car in the distance. Uh, so, I, I can only imagine, again, I can only, uh, this is my speculation, but the, the sense of freedom that automobile gave him, he never had anything like that uh, before. So uh, that's what I was referring to. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see, I did not see that written in a letter, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but I, I'm, I think I'd be, I, I'm be pretty accurate in that, in that uh, thought. But he took a lot of pictures of his car.
<laughs> uh, thank you for a lovely, lovely presentation, Eric. I have a, a, a question and, and a statement. Um, it's, it's really interesting to see that for the 150th anniversary and moving towards that, we decided to talk about his love of nature and express Bloch, you know, express so much of his um, interest in the, in the living world. And, and we've kind of uh, sub, sub, <laughs> you know, sub captioned um, him as the composer in nature's university, which is a quote from somewhere. But I was interested in your mentioning something about the centenary, that you were preparing something for the centenary and it might not have... Okay, uh, yeah, I can explain Of course, we're right. looking towards the 150th uh, anniversary uh, uh, and uh, what can we do? Well, I... I, uh, I uh, can you hear me? All right. I'm assuming you can hear me. Uh, yeah, that the, my reference back in the uh, mid to late 1970s, when I was in grad school, when I there was an an exploration. I think Suzanne knew Eva Mizell, the orchestra uh, conductor in New York, uh, and um, they was there was a strong interest in seeing if there could be a way of using his photography in association with the 1980s and then, but. Uh, I, I know that some of the prints were exhibited in various places. Uh, that that year, I was beginning my uh, assistant professorship here at Cal Poly, where I'm now retired, and I was totally engrossed in classes. And I, I couldn't really, I wish I could have been involved, but I wasn't. But even more important, uh, the uh, fact was that the technology was expensive at that time to do such a thing, cameras taking pictures of pictures. Now the digital makes it a lot easier. That's what I made that little five minute video with. So it makes all the sense in the world now with the technology available to, uh, you know, potentially make something more extensive than the things that I've done. I've literally done on my own in the whole computer here. Um, for the uh, 2030, which is what you're talking about, uh, whatever the term is, 150 years, whatever the, the term is for that, uh, nature I mean, that was his solace. There's no question about it. That was his escape, his solace, his inspiration. Uh, so uh, in the pictures, you can see his room. He says it in his own letters. I mean, so the pictures he took are obviously fundamental to understanding that. Well, it would be wonderful just in, in the first place to have a little um, sequence of nature films to have on the website that we were making and um, but also to think about what you know what we can do to highlight his wonderful photography as as we approach 2030 you know we're not thinking of just waiting for 2030 we we've got a whole <laughs> you know decade to run up to 2030 so all ideas are welcome. I am, I am open to uh, expanding what I've done and uh, using more of the resources I have, uh, which are quite extensive. I mean, there's the archive in Tucson, but uh, the extent to which they are uh, urgent is uh, you know, a question mark. They are working on a major digitizing project of, their, of many of their collections. This is one of the projects, but it's one of many. So they are, I'm in communication with them, but uh, they're very uh, kind, uh, but they're, they're uh, not in a rush, I would say is probably a simple way of putting it. Uh, so what I have is probably the most easily available. So uh, I would just say people get their heads together and uh, if there's a nature oriented, if there's, you know, I, put, I did something with sacred service because those pictures were taken literally when he composed it. Uh, but there's plenty of, you know, more photography. Now, those are probably the high points what I showed, but there's, there's plenty more, lots more self for pictures of him with mushrooms, pictures of him with his, his kids, uh, or kids, Lucien and, 
and uh, Suzanne with mushrooms. I mean, on and on and on. Uh, the whole mushroom hunting thing, I didn't even get into. So uh, that's nature. Hmm. Anyway, thank you. That's uh, somebody. If somebody approaches me with you know uh, something, I I don't need I don't need payment. I've been paid by by the career that I've had. Uh, but I'm welcome to uh, get involved in, in uh, extending it. Well, it's, it's wonderful to have you on, on board for this. And maybe you could mention to the archive 2030 so that yeah. it might stimulate them to say, well, let's do block for, yeah, for 2030. Yeah. I, that, yeah. That's about the time frame that may work for them, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one, thing that I, one thing that some of the people on the call might be of interest and may have ideas or is, I mean, coming up next year, June is the 100th anniversary of the cloud photograph meeting with Stieglitz, which is kind of the connecting point to the history of photography for Ernest Bach. And, you know, this is a special meeting. I, I've taught the history of photography for 36 years, studied with some of the main people in the field back in grad school. And there's a tremendous fascination with music from the angle of photographers and photography. Many of you may not know that Ansel Adams was planning to be a concert pianist before he turned to photography in his late twenties in San Francisco. Uh, and his, his whole uh, uh, discipline, his, his dedication to practice and precision came from his musical training into his photography. And of course, his photography is, is, is well known uh, he, he died in 1984, and I think his, his name is still pretty well known. Uh, so, and that he's not the only one. Stieglitz was an amateur pianist. So there's this, there's quite a fascination with music from the standpoint of photographers uh, in the 20th century. Uh, so, and then Ernest Bloch comes along as a composer, and to my knowledge, still the only one that has this significant, you know, concentration and enthusiasm and practice of photography at a, a reason, an amateur level, but a, a, but a good amateur level and, a and with a lot of care involved. Uh, so there is that connection. And so next year is the 100th anniversary of that, you know, what we like to think of as a pretty famous meeting. Uh, so I'd love to do something at least online uh, for, uh, middle of next year uh, for that cloud photographs meeting. And uh, so that, that, and of course there's many anniversaries that come after that until 2030, but I'll stop. No, no, that's excellent. And I think don't wait for us to ask you for something. You need to tell us what, what needs to be done because you're the expert okay. and we're the receptacle, uh, that, that, you know, <laughs> we'll catch thing. We'll catch anything you throw. <laughs> uh, that, that's the first thing that needs to be done in my opinion, because it's coming up in six months. Yeah, I think we'd like to invite you perhaps to come to the committee meeting and then be able to discuss more what's possible uh, if, you, if you'd be willing. Uh, Geraldine, where are you? I'm in London. <laughs> oh, okay, hello, London. Okay. <laughs> Right. Wonderful. The beauty. Of <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, invite me to your meeting. I, I, I wouldn't know when it would be. So well, it'll be on. It'll be a Zoom meeting. Oh, so. Zoom meeting. Okay. Well, <laughs> all right. Just put, hook me in. Okay. Yeah. Great. We'll do that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Eric. It's twelve thirty, and I'm going to have to take off. Thank you very much. It was very, very interesting. Bryce, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thank you for joining. Yep. Thank you for the invitation. You're welcome. I have to go as well. I'm going to say goodbye to everyone. So lovely seeing you all. Great to see you again, Eric. Yeah. Okay. See you Thank all you. soon. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm detecting a, a slight movement out the door. Maybe before we close this down, is there anyone else with a comment or a question for Eric Johnson? Uh, yes, Greg. Just a, just a hi and a thank you to everyone. Eric, was that, I learned some more today. I really Good. appreciate it. I'm glad. Uh, it was really great. And hi to Alexander and Frank and all the others on the call here. This was really terrific. And I, I look forward to um, things as they develop for the future. 
and I'm stand by to help in any way I can. Uh, Eric, I'll send you a couple of photos that I have from the 1980s celebration we did at Linfield. Oh, uh, sure. And uh, you can just keep them for the archive. Great, great. Um, <clears throat> I know that, you know, people in San Francisco and Cleveland are thinking of doing something to mark the the anniversary of him being there, you know, in 2025 or the centenary. So, you know, maybe there are photo uh, photographs to do with each of these little building blocks, as we call them. Geraldine, uh, could you communicate to me the people in the San Francisco Conservatory in San, in San Francisco? You're right, 2025 will be the 100th anniversary of him assuming directorship of that. Uh, I'd be interested if you could communicate to me, or at least if I could coordinate with you to communicate, because that, that is the other thing. I live in San Luis Obispo, you know, three and a half hours south of San Francisco, so I'm not too far away from you. Uh, I'd be really interested to know what contacts you have that you know that are actually interested in creating some event or some situation for the 100th anniversary of his uh, assuming that position in San Francisco. Sure, we'll put you in touch with uh, Malcolm Singer, who's in touch with them, who has colleagues on their faculty and who are interested. So okay. we Good. can perhaps all get together. Okay. This, is, uh, this is Frank speaking. Hi, Frank. Uh, I just want to mention that I was at the San Francisco Conservatory a couple of weeks ago and I talked to a professor of collaborative piano by the name of Timothy Bach, B-A-C-H, and mentioned to him what we were doing internationally and we've, we've been uh, communicating uh, and um, if you go and visit the San Francisco Conservatory of Music uh, in their huge atrium lobby, there is a rather large photo of Ernest Bloch on display. So uh, they certainly do remember him in their, uh, in their public place, um, but he seemed to be uh, not very knowledgeable about what the history. So. Uh, like I say, I started a communication with the San Francisco Conservatory, and I'll talk more about that later. Good. Thank well, you. It needs something needs to happen there, and it needs to be coordinated. And I obviously I could I could bring photographs up there, and because uh, it's not very far away for me, uh, and uh, something needs to happen there. Okay, well, I think we're probably going to meet on Zoom. Is it next Wednesday? Is it also at seven o'clock, Alex? <coughs> if, I so if, I, if I if I if I to participate, yes, it would have to be at that same hour. Yes. Yeah, yes. so let's seven make it seven o'clock. So anybody who feels they can contribute something to the discussion is welcome to to be there. But. Um, Frank will be there, hopefully Malcolm will. And so, you know, we'll, we'll certainly try and tie all these things together in a, in a really productive way. Just Thanks. let me know, send me a link. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jesse. Of course, thank you. Great seeing everybody. Take care then, bye. Yeah, thanks so much, Jesse. Sure.